Okay, I am so honored and delighted about who is speaking next. Dr. Ron Westrom, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Eastern Michigan University. His name will be familiar to anyone who has read the State of DevOps reports that I had the privilege of working on for six years with Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble from 2013 to 2019. It is the cross-population study that spanned over 36,000 respondents that allowed us to better understand what high-performing technology organizations looked like. We looked at the architectural practices, technical practices, and cultural norms. And without a doubt, what those cultural norms might look like were made possible by the work of Dr. Ron Westrom. He received his PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and has spent decades studying complex organizations including healthcare, aviation, and the nuclear industry. And one of the models he created was a famous Westrom organizational typology model that brilliantly categorized organizations into pathological, bureaucratic, and generative. It's featured prominently in the State of DevOps research, the DevOps Handbook, and the Accelerate books. <laughs> and when Dr. Forsgren CC'd me on some correspondence that she had with Dr. Westrom, I almost fell out of my chair. I was able to interview him for four hours on my podcast, The Ideal Cast. And I'm so delighted that he'll be teaching us today about information flow in organizations and providing a case study of an organization that you have probably heard of. Here's Dr. Westrom. Today, we're going to talk about information flow cultures. And we're going to talk about the cultures of organizations. So what the devil is organizational culture? Well, organizational culture is a complicated thing. For instance, it has the following characteristics. So organizational culture is practices. Organizational culture is thoughts. Organizational culture is feelings. And it is symbols. So while all these are important, we're going to use another index, the flow of information. Why is information flow the right thing to do? The reason is basically information is the lifeblood of organizations. If the organization has a good flow of information, the organization will do well. If it has a bad flow, it's not going to do very well. Information is also a powerful index of how an organization functions. An information flow culture, in fact, reflects how managers shape values and behavior. And we're going to describe three different information flow types. One of them is generative, where you have a high flow of information, the best. Then there's bureaucratic, which has a medium flow of information, and pathological, which has a low flow. So let's look at pathological flow. In pathological organizations, you get a low cooperation, very high conflict, an emphasis on taking care of the leaders, strict boundaries, messengers get shot, you have low creativity. So you have a toxic environment. In a bureaucratic situation, you get modest cooperation. The emphasis is on rules and regulation. You have a problems with silos. Messengers are tolerated, not necessarily encouraged. Conflicts are tamped down and creativity is allowed. And here is my slide, which I think reflects the flow of bureaucratic information, which is that it's slow. Now, what we'd really like to have is a generative flow of information where we have high cooperation. We have emphasis on the mission. We have boundaryless organization where things move quickly over the boundaries. Speaking up is encouraged. And in fact, people have psychological safety and high creativity. So here is my example of how the highly creative organization is supposed to function. I think Star Trek is a perfect model. Now, let me emphasize one of the features that goes with generative information flow. At Google, they had a project called Project Aristotle, and he studied what made for an effective team. The number one feature of an effective team was psychological safety, the ability to speak your mind without fear of punishment. When communication is easy, there is more of it but it's also the right kind of communication. I like to say that a high flow of communication has these three characteristics. Number one, it's timely. Number two, it's easy to understand and comes in a form that's easy to, to make sense of. Number three, it meets the receiver's needs. Now there's a classic example of this. During the famous Redstone rocket program, which was one of NASA's first, a prototype went off course and crashed. Werner von Braun, the head of the project, tried to figure out by many analyses what had happened. The analyses did not suggest a cause. 
Now they were going to have to start from scratch to redesign the missile. But then an engineer came to Von Braun and he said, I think I did it. But how? Von Braun wanted to know. Well, the engineer said, I touched a part of the circuit with a screwdriver and got a spark. I checked and the circuit seemed to be fine. But maybe that was the problem. Well, it turned out that was the problem. Okay, so the problem got solved. And then Von Braun sent the, the engineer a bottle of champagne. So take a moment to think about your organization. What would happen when an engineer admits to making such a big mistake? Does he get a bottle of champagne? Generative cultures are often found in high performance organizations. They are common in high reliability systems that require greater cooperation for success. They're typical of elite military units whose cooperation is legendary. For instance, the Navy SEALs. And they are often seen in consumer and service industries when exceptional consumer satisfaction is the goal. And they are often led by technological maestros. So what is a technological maestro? Well, this word was coined by Arthur Squires in his book, The Tender Ship, about leadership and technology in World War II. And it meant the top leaders had these characteristics. Number one, technical virtuosity. Number two, a high energy level. Number three, an ability to grasp the key questions. Number four, the ability to grasp the key details, high standards, and a hands-on attitude. Now, here's another example of a maestro. Um, in June 1978, an engineering student called an architect named William, William Le Mesurier, who had designed key parts of the Citicorps building. 